Okay, hi. Um, okay, so I hope all of you can hear me. So, uh, as uh, rightly said, we are going to start today with the topic of uh, how to craft a unique customer experience strategy. And uh, before that, you know, I'll just li like to give you a story. So I think once upon a time, we only had letters, like those snail mails, or maybe phones, you know, to contact the companies and, you know, tell our complaints or, you know, talk to companies. And then the times changed. We had emails, we had call centers, we could call them, talk to them. Then times changed. I think the entire thing of social media came in. So we had Facebook, we had Instagram, we had chatbots, and we had review sites. So now the game changed. So all the customers, they could actually talk about your company in the open. All this while it was just one-to-one -one with the company and the customer. Now with social media, they could just talk about your company anywhere and anybody could see it. So people can go and complain about your company, anybody can read it. And if they're really happy about your products, they will say happy things about it. So that's how the game has changed. And today we are going to talk about customer experience, how things are going on, and how things are changing. You know, I think the race is totally on in terms of customer experience. Companies are recognizing the importance of delivering an experience that makes them stand out from the competition. It's become very, very important. And we have very eminent industry personals today here. And, uh, you know, we will just hear from them, you know, what they think about this topic. So before that, let me introduce uh, each of them one by one. So I have uh, Idan. Hi. So uh, Idan uh, is the APAC marketing director for Food Panda. And uh, obviously, how many guys you use Food Panda? Can you just raise your hands? Okay, so you have a survey over here. Great. So I think it's, uh, as all of you know, it's an on-demand food delivery service. Uh, it's almost uh, now being used by 10 million people in eight countries in APAC region. Idan, uh, she graduated in business and managerial economics before specializing in customer relationship management uh, for the online gaming industry. As Food Panda undergoes a hyper growth period, that's what she was talking to me you know, uh, just a few while back. Um, they're heavily investing in the APAC region. Idan is responsible for the strategy and the implementation of offline as well as online brand marketing efforts across the region. Please welcome her. <laughs> then we have uh, Sami. Sami comes from the other side. You know, she comes basically from the consulting uh, firm side. He is the one who gives a lot of ideas and strategy to companies. So Sami is a very seasoned insights and consulting professional who has been in the industry for the last 20 years. He is heading uh, the brand consulting firm called Clear Strategy, which is a part of MNC Sachi Network. He is an eminent speaker across many forums, and uh, today uh, he will be sharing his very valuable insights around customer experience. Please welcome him. Thank you. And last but not the least, we have Mantaj. So Mantaj uh, is uh, a passionate marketing and business development professional with more than 13 years of experience in Asia and USA in social media, in digital marketing, channel marketing, business strategy, and partnerships. So that's a very, very diverse profile. And she currently leads the digital marketing and e-commerce for Asia in Microsoft the consumer devices and sales, where she manages a territory of more than 11 countries focused on changing the digital retail landscape for Microsoft's partners. With, the, with her strong focus on retail digital transformation, she can often be seen speaking at many industry events and training the partners on e-commerce and omni-channel strategies. So please welcome all the panelists with a thunderous applause, and let's start the session today. Okay, so, um, you know, I think we have a lot of people in the room, and uh, I was thinking that perhaps we can start the entire discussion uh, by understanding uh, what customer experience actually is. You know, so can you start, Adan? 
Yeah, sure. Is it working? Um, so for us, customer experience is um, basically every single touch point the customer has um, with us as a business. It starts with um, our online ads or promoters on the street, um, goes to the um, interaction on the website and app, to the um, experience with the rider at the door, the food quality, the packaging, um, interaction with customer service. All of those are basically the accumulated um, interactions the customer has with us that um, generate the, the perception of the, uh, what the customer thinks about us, uh, basically his experience with us. Okay, uh, Mantaj, I would just like to know that from your context and from your perspective of Microsoft, how would you define um, you know, uh, customer, customer experience? Yeah. Yeah. Um, not very differently. I think all brands kind of think of it the same way. Um, for us, what has probably changed is that, and I was saying this in the last session, so apologize for repeating for the folks who were in the room here before. Um, we don't think of it now just as offline or as online. We're starting to take this customer journey or the UX perspective where we know people are having multiple touch points across those two journeys interchangeably. So it's very much about taking a customer focus and that's what customer journey or a customer experience has become for us, thinking of the consumer as the channel, as opposed to thinking of, you know, are we, a, are we giving a, an experience online and are we giving an experience offline? So that's a slightly different retail flavor that I wanted to add to that. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your perspective. Sami, you know, uh, Mantas just talked about this whole thing of consumer journey. And that's like, you know, very important here in the marketing world. So you have any views on that? Uh, yes, uh, but before that, I'll just uh, add a few lines on uh, the customer experience perspective as well. Uh, and as rightly put, it's the entire process that uh, you have to look at. And as Mantaj said, uh, no discrimination between online and offline. Look at it holistically. I'd probably add uh, uh, a perspective on uh, uh, the delight or uh, what efforts we make because. Uh, when you think of customer experience, uh, that's a natural tendency to talk about uh, how am I going to make my customers happier, uh, how am I going to deliver great service, and so on. And that's, that's fair. But I think uh, an obvious uh, a point, uh, a very simple point that we sometimes uh, miss out on is, uh, is actually making sure that the gap between what the customers expect you to deliver and what they actually are uh, seeing in the market delivered, that's what matters uh, more. So it's not necessary to drive all efforts in doing everything that you can to delight the customer. I mean, I'm, I'm saying that because there's a commercial implication to every aspect, right? What's more important is to manage the gap between expectations that you set and what you uh, deliver. And that's a very significant consideration because in today's world, you need to figure out where those expectations are coming from. Right? And once you get a hang of uh, what you really want to deliver from a brand purpose perspective, what your employees are uh, uh, feeling that they should uh, deliver, once you set that bar, then you know how much you need to uh, deliver. And for all it takes, you just need, need to deliver what customers expect. Then they'll be happy. Thank you. Uh, just taking from uh, Sami's point of customer expectations, uh, Idan, this is a question to you. Uh, can you please tell us the ways today's modern consumers, they interact with your brand? And what has changed about the relationships between the companies and the customers, you know, so? Yeah, sure. Um, so Food Panda actually operates in the region for about six, seven years um, in many different ways, many different countries. Um, and up until a few years back, I would say a few years ago, um, we used to list the restaurants in a platform, but the entire delivery was done by the restaurants themselves. Meaning from the moment a user placed an order with our platform, this is where information and there was no transparency where the order is, where is it coming from, um, delivery time was often more than one hour, and all of that was acceptable. Um, users were um, accepting that this was the overall consensus of um, what food delivery is. Um, it's a bit hard to imagine as uh, today we, we are anxious um, and, and want to know and feel everything. Um, but this was the case up until a few years back. Um, since then, Food Panda has set to um, really focus on customer experience. Um, and one of the parts was um, committing to transparency. So if you guys, for those who order, you probably know, but um, 
we really make a huge effort to let the customer know exactly um, what state his order is. Like from the moment is the restaurant still cooking the food, where exactly is the rider, is he on your street, is he next to your door? Um, and really provide um, all the information that we can to tell the, guy, uh, tell the customer exactly what stage is the order. On top of that, we have set to um, improve the overall experience. So basically, from one or two hours that used to be the delivery time in the past, now we deliver in less than 30 minutes, often 20, 25, 27 minutes, um, improving the inventory, so really curating which restaurants are on our platform, making sure that we have enough inventory, good inventory, and at different price points in every single country that we operate in every zone. Um, so really committing to um, what we can deliver to the customer. Thanks. Uh, you know, that's an interesting point. And what I get is that, you know, today we talk a lot about moments that matter. And within hunger moments, there are so many micro moments of uh, delivering and then waiting for the order, then where is the rider, you know, so, the, so uh, talking about that, Sami, can you just talk a little bit about moments that matter, you know, as a thing in customer experience from your experience of consulting? I think uh, uh, from an insight perspective, really understanding uh, what consumers are uh, doing in the moment, what does that mean in terms of how they are feeling, or rather from doing to thinking, what they're thinking in that moment, and that thinking, what feeling does it uh, result in? Understanding that uh, spectrum is uh, really important. So doing, thinking, and feeling. And I can give you an example. You know, when you are, uh, when you are at a McDonald's, when you enter a McDonald's and get into a queue to get your fries and uh, burger, I guess if you, give a lot of thought to what a consumer might be feeling, the exact emotion that the consumer feels is that of uh, anxiety. And you know why? Because everything about McDonald's is predictable. You know exactly what you will get, you know how it will look like, you know the price point you're paying, you know how much time uh, uh, it, it will take, you know what the process is, what queue you will stand and how, what will happen next and so on. And when you get into that sort of a high level of predictivity uh, situation, you are almost uh, anxious and anxiety uh, creeps in saying, will it happen? I hope I, I, I get what I, what I need. Knowing that uh, emotion is crucial for a, from a customer experience perspective because then the delivery is not about uh, saying, hello, Sammy, how are you? How's, how's your day? Well, it's great and I'll be happy, but I'll be more happy if, if you meet that predictable process because my anxiety will then be only resolved. So every moment uh, it's important to work through this uh, spectrum of uh, what are my consumers actually doing? What, what are they then thinking? And where does, where does that lead to in terms of a feeling perspective? And once you nail down that feeling, then you'll know exactly how to, uh, what to do to deliver great service. You'll know that it's not about greeting me. It's about, of course, greeting me is great, but greeting me without uh, uh, resolving my anxiety isn't going to work for me. OK, so speaking about anxiety, I think last year, last year I think a lot of you are aware about this, that United Airlines in the US had a brand crisis in which around 1.4 billion in value was just wiped out because of just one passenger's experience going viral. So speaking about that, Mantaj, how are you driving improvements for uh, customer experience in your company? Can you just speak a little bit about that? Um, very differently than United Airlines, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, I think in our world where we are selling most of our products, uh, whether they're you know, software products like Office or Windows, or they're hardware products like laptops, like Surface, or Xbox, it, so it's gaming, it's very, very different psyche and a very different consumer. Um, where we sell through is essentially through those partners, through the retail partners. And as a brand that sells through partners, what we can do at best, other than having you know, the best top of the funnel awareness that we can create for these partners, is also to enable them to sell more for us and empower them to sell more for yeah. us. So how do we make those improvements for them, especially in their digital journey, um, is you know, a constant challenge, essentially, because every retailer and every partner also is on their own digital transformation journey. So leveling with them at first in terms of where they're at, and then offering them solutions 
whether it's the best of content so that we're you know really storytelling our products very well and we provide that content to them seamlessly whether it's through content syndication so that they don't have to worry about manual uploads or giving them content that's localized and is relevant to their markets that's all on the content piece to help them do that and sell more um, the other improvements that we try to drive are on the user journey itself. So many a times we offer partners tools like um, widgets, whether it's a widget that helps them solve choice paralysis. Um, think about the last time you bought a laptop online and you went and you searched for laptop and got yeah. a thousand results. It's just a complete choice paralysis. So what we offer are things like help me choose tools to these retailers and they embed those into their websites and it essentially asks them more human-centric questions, more use case-based questions to help a user find the right laptop for them. Uh, the, it doesn't stop there. We also then help with wayfinding inside the store because oftentimes our customers will start their journey online but then walk into one of our partner's stores. But inside the partner's store, it's again chaos yeah. because it's aisles and aisles of laptops and hardware. So we try and do, uh, we offer more tools to be able to help people wayfind to the right laptop. And that's essentially the way we're trying to drive these more omni-channel slash omnipresent kind of experiences. Yeah, so that was my next question about omni-channel. But yeah. before that, I think Mantash really touched upon a very nice point on storytelling yeah. or uh, getting the uh, human centricism in your whole CX planning. So can you guys uh, talk a little bit about that? You know, how you are doing it in your company right now? Or maybe for your clients, you have observed something? So uh, thanks, Mantaj. I think uh, Mantaj has given a good perspective on uh, uh, how uh, she's helping uh, with uh, the choice paralysis or uh, even further down the selling uh, process when you go into the store. If I can cover for uh, uh, what happens uh, upstream in terms of uh, product development, uh, again, it's a very human-centric and uh, inside perspective that will lead you to deliver better experiences. I'll give an example of uh, uh, two products, uh, competing products, uh, Siri and uh, Google Home. And uh, I know from whatever little I've uh, read that uh, the products are struggling a little bit. I mean, you would have expected uh, universal acceptance for uh, these sort of uh, products. Can I check uh, Google Home and uh, Siri? How many of you use it every day? Google Home? Or Siri. Or Siri. So, let's so that's hardly that's hardly five percent of uh, of us, and don't forget we are, uh, if I may say so, the sophisticated of the lot, right? Uh, everyone's uh, well aware of technology. Everyone's well aware of marketing. You're like, attending such uh, great sessions and, and and so on, and yet uh, we uh, only five percent of us are uh, using it. So if you think about uh, what what other insights might have. Uh, driven uh, adoption for these sort of uh, products. That's where you need to focus on. I'll give a very short example, uh, just, a, just a minute, Sean. Uh, I track back to uh, 40 years ago when I saw my dad uh, interact uh, with his uh, quote unquote assistant. He was in the public service, so he had an assistant. And the assistant, I think, uh, my dad loved his assistant because uh, the assistant knew all my dad's preferences. And my assistant at the back end also had great relationship with uh, travel agents and service providers to make things happen. Now cut that to Siri and Google Home. Google Home and Siri, well, they learn about your preferences. But a simple setup process of like five minutes to know what your travel preferences are, what you want to do, what, how do you want to use Siri or Google Home, can make those two uh, products come up to speed within five minutes to know who you are and what you want uh, to do with those products. Then at the back end, it's all about partnerships for, for that Siri and Google Home could drive that uh, enable a uh, proposition like, hey Siri, I want a cheap ticket to India. Can you get that for me? Siri knows uh, that I fly uh, SQ and comes back uh, saying, I've got a great deal for 500 bucks. Should I lock it in? And I say yes, and the transaction is complete. I don't think that can happen uh, today because uh, you know we have not thought through uh, how we are going to use that uh, product. We have not thought through the pain points of uh, uh, a consumer, and we would have if we had to uncover a penetrating uh, insight. Thank you. So next, uh, I, you know, as I'm taking from Antaj's uh, uh, 
uh, what she spoke. Uh, and uh, one of the very important aspects is omni-channel. There are so many different channels now uh, you know, to drive customer experience. So what is the importance of omni-channel and channel integration when it comes to customer experience? Edan, would you like to take a lead on this? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so for us, we look at this uh, at two, two aspects. Um, from product side, we actually put mobile first. Uh, you can also look at yourself. Um, no one here is uh, more than a um, few centimeters away from their phone. Um, but we also want to, to provide the option to, to use our service in any um, of the platforms. So unlike some of our competitors, um, we also offer web and mobile web um, experience. So if you want to order on, um, on the office or um, while you're away, um, or when you're on the way to work or on the way back, anywhere you want, um, we, we can be there for you. Um, in terms of marketing, we actually invested a lot in building um, a complete infrastructure that is um, working together um, and all channels are basically aligned, meaning we invested a lot in recommendation model and knowing which are the um, preferred cuisines, preferred restaurants, price point, all kinds of different elements about the customer um, and how do we identify this customer. And then we can push this out um, if it's for online marketing, if it's for um, CRM for existing users, even um, for um, all kinds of um, other platforms, even or, uh, on our website. Um, so we curate the message to really fit each and every customer um, at the best, let's say, channel that you would like to get this message and um, the best message that suits the customer. Thanks, uh, Ivan. Uh, you just spoke about recommendation model. Uh, would you like to speak about it a little bit to us? You know, what exactly you mean by that? Yeah, so um, Food Panda is, um, we worked on it quite a bit. Um, we try to basically utilize the model both on site and off site. Um, so when you come to the website, you have different recommendations. One, uh, for example, you will have Swimline that is recommended for you. So if we know you already based on your previous orders, based on the um, different things you have browsed through, um, we will try to match you with the most um, suitable um, restaurants for you. Um, we also have, for example, different swim lane, like more on a concept side. If it's for breakfast or lunch or dinner, we try to match those for you. Um, and same will go for, for marketing channels. So we will communicate to you ideally in the best times for you. Or um, if we have a deal on the restaurant that you like, we will try to push that out for you and um, get the most yeah, suitable message and the best uh, channel we can. Thanks, Ivan. Can I just add to that? Sure. So I think in terms of recommendations, and for us, that's uh, for our products, it's ratings and reviews, right? And I'm sure all brands here would agree, whether you're selling your products through your own channel or you're selling through an e-commerce platform or you know a, another retailer's platform as well, it's so important today to have those ratings and reviews, uh, trustworthy ratings and reviews, really, really um, at a certain level. In fact, we've seen when we have about three and a half to four stars and above, that's when we start seeing conversion rates increase. When we have about 30 to 50 reviews, that's when we start seeing. So we've even got these sort of critical mass numbers that we are aiming for within each one of the platforms. And these ratings and reviews, I mean, they're not just on an Amazon or a Lazada. People are also going to the CNET for you know, for, for our industry, for consumer electronics, they go to CNET and they see what's the review that CNET has given. And then how do we bring that CNET review into maybe a HarveyNorman.com where we might go shop and, and experience here? So those are all, it's, it's very interesting to kind of think of that customer experience, not from an omni-channel perspective. I think the channel now is the consumer, right? So thinking of those different touch points for the customer journey and then blurring the lines between online and offline and thinking of what are the different pain points within that customer journey. How do I solve them, whether it's an online channel or an offline channel, how do I solve them? So ratings and reviews are, I think, super important. They're the number one purchase intent creator for us, yeah. for our products. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter whether those ratings or reviews are sitting online. Yes, people read them online, but you can even bring them into a store. Thanks. Sami, yes, I was just coming to you. Being on a consulting site to clients, and she brought a very important point for customer reviews. So you have any views, or have you seen anything like that happening with your clients? As in reviews, uh, making its way to? Making its way or making it go, both ways. I'll say uh, reviews in general uh, give you a 
picture of both extremities, right? I mean, things that are really working and things uh, that are not. So it's a great uh, source. Uh, but from a, and, and that's, that's very valid to use uh, those reviews to drive uh, your uh, objective for that channel. Uh, but from a strategy uh, perspective, from a every touch point perspective, I would say uh, what's also important is, uh, again, I harp using the same framework uh, that I talked about, where every touch point you really question yourself in terms of uh, what are consumers trying to do, therefore what are they thinking, and what they may be feeling. Because every touch point the cus consumer or your customer is trying to use it for different reasons. Maybe to understand what's out there, maybe to get familiar with your product and services, maybe to reassure themselves, maybe it's a quality, maybe it's about uh, comparison. So understanding uh, what, what is happening in that uh, space and again going down to what, what's the emotion that they are uh, experiencing is, is significant. And reviews will, will help you because reviews will uh, fuel some of these uh, uh, touch uh, inputs as well. You might need to go beyond reviews and talk to real consumers as well, but reviews are a great starting point. And you know, it used to be that uh, the companies that make the product could harp about their product and talk about it and people would believe them. Mm. In today's world, if you make the product, I'm not gonna listen to you because yeah, you make the product but you're probably only gonna tell me good things about it, right? So it's the third party ratings and reviews that really are what matter. Yes, so coming to that point, I think one thing what I wanted to ask, uh, you know, especially Idan and Mantash, is that, you know, there's a short term aspect and there's a long term aspect, you know, of customer experience. Uh, is it short term or long term, or is it both? Can you just talk a little bit about that? So maybe you can start. Yeah. Um, uh, for me, m I'm much more lean towards the long term side of it, right? I think we've got, a, I don't think we do a good enough job of this, but we definitely need to focus a lot more in terms of really figuring out the customer lifetime value. Because when we do things like making sure that these little touch points, whether it's today, when you're ready to buy a product today, or whether you're on the waiting list to see something that might come out tomorrow, um, if we are making those touch points positive ones and you're experiencing the brand in a positive way, you really are creating a long-term value. Right. So we see people who have had positive experiences with the brand, they not only churn less, not only buy more, but they also speak about our brand a lot more, so there's an element of word of mouth that happens as well. Um, and essentially the objective becomes to create these super fans, right? I mean, or fans to start with and eventually make, the, make them into super fans. But there is a huge measurable and immeasurable benefit to these, uh, the, the long-term benefits. Thanks. Idan, uh, knowing about your brand, you know, it's about instant gratification, right? It's about hunger. So how you deal with the short-term versus long-term value creation? Yeah. Um, so we also um, look at customer experience as a long-term measure. Um, we definitely do see that customers accumulate experiences over their, their lifetime with us, right? But um, we do pay special attention to um, the first interaction. Like um, many other aspects in life, there is no um, second chance to do, good imp to do first impression. So um, we, from, from all we know, from all the information we have, the first order is key to whether or not a customer will give us um, a second chance. And if we have consecutive good experiences, if we continuously have good interactions um, with the customer, if it's with the brand touch point, with the rider, with the food, with customer service, basically all of these accumulated touch points, um, eventually we believe we will generate loyalty um, and, and the customer will stay with us. Thank you. Now I'm coming to a very important question to this session because sometimes we use a lot of terms very loosely. You know, so we use the term brand experience and then we use the term customer experience, right? In my head, maybe both are different or both are similar. So would you like to talk about a little bit how is customer experience different from brand experience? You know, anybody of you can just take a shot at it. Yeah, I can say a few words. Um, so basically, brand experience and customer experience both of course talk about the customer, um, about the user, about um, um, this person who, who interacts with us. While um, brand experience is, um, let's say, catering for a user before he becomes our customer. So everything before um, his actual purchase with us, while customer experience 
helps the user throughout the journey with us, with the ordering process, after ordering, um, and everything um, in between. So would you say customer experience is a new brand? Um, I would say they go um, well together. Um, so uh, our brand image and our um, overall brand experience will help drive more users into you know, our doorstep while um, excellent customer experience will get the user through that, um, let's say, door into making a purchase and hopefully um, get the user to, to be um, a repeating user and uh, a loyal customer. Thank you, that's very well said. Uh, Manta, you have any other perspective on this? No, I, I completely, uh, she literally read my mind, so no. Sami, would you like to add anything? As a consultant, I'll have to first complicate the issue and then come uh, solve <laughs> yeah. it. So to complicate the issue, I think uh, I talk about three constructs actually. Uh, one is uh, uh, brand purpose or brand uh, mission or brand experience. Mm. And that's important because businesses are continuously questioning themselves in terms of what business are, are, we, uh, are we in? Is my brand supposed to do this and so on? The second construct I'll introduce is uh, you know, product experience and that's about your value proposition, what you actually do. And the third construct, which we can't all escape from, is the market experience, because there are so many different uh, competing uh, products and uh, services. And I think customer experience is the center of all of these uh, three circles. So you have a brand experience in terms of what you want your brand to achieve, a visionary goal, or what you want to do. You have your product uh, experience, where you craft out uh, product propositions uh, aligned with the uh, brand uh, vision. and. You, have, of course, have your market and your uh, compete competitors who are providing similar uh, experiences. And customer experience actually could sit right in the center of those uh, three circles. Thanks, Sami. Uh, Mantash, the next question is for you. Uh, have you been, uh, you already handling, you know, the entire portfolio of digital marketing and e-commerce for Asia. You know, uh, what do you think is the role of data, analytics, and consumer insights? in your you know, customer experience strategy and decision making? Yeah, huge is, oh. the, is the single word answer. <laughs> um, I don't think we can do marketing in today's world without looking at data and customer insights. I mean, if we are, I don't think you're doing marketing. I don't, th and forget about today. I think even while traditional marketing in the good old days of direct mailers, et cetera, were happening, even then customer insights were so key. It's just that data enables us to now target a lot better, right? Um, I would say, you know, we have several tools that we use yeah. other than, you know, the Google Analytics and the Facebooks and everything else that we all know about. Um, there are some interesting tools that we've developed that help us. So one of the challenges that we face is we are running several campaigns with several different partners, right? Think about the next Surface, for example, that's going to be uh, being launched. And we have lots of partners selling that product. Uh, how do we know how these partners are performing for us? How are these campaigns performing? It's believe it or not, really hard to get that data back. So when we do get that data, we have a Power BI tool that helps us churn out what are the insights that are coming out of this. So you know, we look at everything from the top to the bottom of a funnel, although we know customer journey is not a nice linear funnel, but it's the way to kind of simplify it and look at it. Um, we also have uh, AI built bots that we use that help us actually go scour the websites of our partners so um, that we know along every touch point in the customer journey how are these websites performing for us. Wow. And we actually put a score behind it. So it, it enables us to go have a deeper conversation with our partner and say, you know what, when it comes to finding a product on your website, it's really easy. But then when it comes to actually learning about a product, it's really hard. So here are the tools that we can provide you to help fix that gap. Um, those kinds of analytics and tools are, you know, what we breathe by. And Microsoft is an extremely analytical company anyway. Yeah. It's probably why I work there. Um, but we are, we are really hooked. We're, we're data nerds when it comes to this. Thanks. Yeah. I think those were very good insights, and I hope we all learned from that. Uh, Idan, uh, coming to you, in Food Panda, what kind of data analytics and customer insights uh, generally you use, or do you think it's important how you drive it? Yeah, very, very important, um, and I definitely agree with um, everything she said, um, and I covered m most of uh, the data points. Maybe just to add to that, um, we try to also add um, qualitative data. So um, a part of our product, um, let's say roadmap and discussions, um, we often touch base with users on user testing sessions. 
Um, so before we, let's say, embark on a journey of um, developing any new feature or prioritizing some features to be developed, um, we basically get um, our, our customers or potential customers to, um, to, to interact with um, the prototype and what we try to achieve and see how that works for them. If this answers a need, if this is something that is useful and if they can, like the fact that we identify this as a need doesn't necessarily mean um, that they do as well. Um, okay. So we keep um, also in touch with the customers wow. on that. Great. Okay. Idan yeah. and I had uh, a quick chat before this uh, session, an interesting one that hits uh, at the heart of your question in terms of insights. And what we're talking about is, uh, of course, uh, she has access to a lot of uh, data, right? And uh, the data could be something like uh, a lot of orders uh, happening outside uh, normal meal hours, lunchtime or dinner time. So, you know, 50, 60% of ordering that happens outside this uh, normal uh, time. And that's, that's good data. It's about, it talks about uh, what con consumers are uh, doing. Uh, but if you put some thinking uh, on that data, then what that data suggests is that hunger pangs are striking consumers outside uh, normal uh, meal times. And that's, that becomes interesting. It becomes interesting because you've now transformed uh, data into an interesting uh, observation. Then you start uh, taking that uh, observation into the feeling zone and you say, okay, you know, is there any tension uh, element in that uh, observation? What happens when there are hunger pangs? Well, you're in a meeting, you're working, and the very act of picking up a phone and ordering from Food Panda, while it might seem really very easy, still takes a couple of steps. You open it, there's choice stress, so many restaurants, you've got to select and you want to make sure, and you know, it, you, are not, you don't want to interrupt your flow. So once you have taken that uh, basic data into the feeling space you, and uncovered attention, you might be able to use that in creating a very innovative offers, like a one-touch uh, button on, uh, on Food Panda that uh, you touch and Food Panda knows you're hungry, and in 20 minutes, whatever food it, it, it can get to you, it gets it to you because it's learned from your preferences as well. So here's a great example of how you've taken data, converted into a nice uh, observation, gone through the thinking process of what consumers might be feeling, identified attention, and use that data for uh, product service innovation and, and delivering great experiences. Idan, have you heard of uh, the Domino's Easy Order? Yeah, I yeah. was just saying that yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She was just talking about it. Um, yeah. Yes, but you know, very stimulating discussion, but that brings me to a very important question. It might be a little difficult, but please, uh, um, you know, I want to ask this, uh, is, you know, with all this technology, this real time, you know, all data feeding in, all this big data coming in, you know, um, do you think it is dehumanizing customer experience? Or do you think there is a way to humanize it more? You know, there is always a challenge of data coming in and the human touch going on. You know, so what do you think about it? Um, if I may, I don't think so. I think that technology is actually enabling more human touch points. It, we might have gone the other way around in the beginning where you know it feels like it's all data, all profiles, there's no really name to it, et cetera, but I think there's so much more technology that exists today in personalization, in hyper-personalization yeah. in many cases as well. Um, I know we try to do, uh, to solve these pain points of being on a website, seeing a thousand choices in choice paralysis mode, and then really wanting to talk to somebody and you don't really want to be seeing just a screen but talk to somebody. So yeah. while there are chatbots and chatbots tend to be very bot, um, you know, there are, we're starting to see actually a change going from chatbots to actually human-centered chat platforms. Um, we're starting to see ways to do, have a, a, a shopper assistant online where you can actually do a face-to-face -face okay. interaction. Yeah. Um, you're starting to see human elements. I'll, I'll give you an example of Chroma, which is a large consumer electronics uh, uh, retailer in India. And on th in their stores, you can actually fix up an appointment with the manager of that store. You have a picture of that manager. You can call the manager and speak to him. Um, you know exactly when you're going to go meet that manager, who to look for. So there are lots of little ways that technology is actually enabling that 
human touch point and, and we have to do that, right? And again, this talks about how the offline and the online channels are blurring. Um, at the same time, we also make sure that the actual human human element, which is when you walk inside a store and you want to meet a representative that can help you out, that person is also trained, that person also speaks the same language and tells the same story as what's being told online or what's being shown in your visual merchandise. Um, so all of these three elements actually really need to come together for someone that's you know selling through retail. Thanks, um, Mantaj. I think that's very stimulating and it's a, a good uh, thought starter for your point. Any point of view on this? You know, humanization, dehumanization. Yeah. Um, so we definitely believe that with automations and technology, we can be much more efficient, right? So problems that if at the time you used to, um, you had to wait in queue, wait for a person, and then it's up to, to that person's mind to choose or decide what to do in certain cases. Um, right now with automations, you can get your, um, um, let's say problems or questions or um, all solved and answered within a few minutes, um, or much more efficiently, much faster, um, and um, I, quality is much, much better. Um, but um, also, like she said, we try to keep the human touch. And if somebody wants to interact with a person, uh, we do have customer service agents there that are trained, that are willing to help and solve um, any question. Sami, being on the consulting side, you know, dealing with so many clients, what is your view on this? You know, what do you think is happening and what should happen going forward? Yeah, I, I can't be sitting uh, next to a tech uh, company rep and a tech enabled company rep mm -hmm. and uh, you know put down technology. But I think uh, uh, we all agree tech, tech is great. But I think uh, one observation I've made is uh, technology is uh, rapidly making uh, some aspects of our life uh, extinct. And unless we know what those aspects are and give some thought to whether those aspects can be rejuvenated in today's digital experiences, we'd be missing out on a big opportunity. And let me just elaborate on that. So there are two, one or two aspects of life which I can talk about which technology is fast uh, eliminating. I bet uh, my 13-year-old daughter has no clue of what it means like to look out of a car uh, window when, when, when we are speeding and just gaze out in the open and mindlessly just go in a flow of thought. That's called reflection, which some of us uh, would do quite often. And I, I doubt the next generation would even know what that is. Uh, I doubt uh, we are as resourceful as uh, uh, we were, right? You know, because technology is putting everything in a, on a platter uh, uh, for us. So if we, are, if we were to identify these aspects of life, and the window to identify these aspects of life is very short, because after our generation, the next generation won't even know what to identify. Once you have identified those aspects of life, then you need to think of how can you use them as springboards to rejuvenate uh, your current experiences. So let's talk about uh, search engines here, Google and uh, Yahoo and uh, all of that, right? As a parent, uh, I love the search engines because uh, they give the answers, whatever uh, they need for my, for my daughter. But uh, I feel they don't uh, make her as resourceful as I would uh, have liked her to be. So how about a search engine that actually doesn't give you the answer, but gives you only milestones to get to the answer? Right? So it still gives you the answer, but gives you it, gives it to you in milestones, so it still maintains some level of resourcefulness. And this is a great example of how an aspect of life like resourcefulness has been identified and pulled back to deliver an experience that at least some parents might be looking for. But Google and Yahoo think that getting search to you faster, making it more relevant, is the only way to deliver great experience. May not be. Okay. So I think uh, you know we are running a little short on time, but I wish I could ask more questions because it was very stimulating. But uh, any other points uh, any of you would like to touch before I open the uh, question and answers for the audience? Any, anything which you think you haven't covered you'd like to speak about? Mantaj? Um, no, I think you know I've uh, had the opportunity to share all my thoughts and more <laughs> in a session before. So if you didn't attend that, I think you know my 
biggest takeaway in the last few years that I've worked in the MarTech space and in the um, technology marketing space in particular has really been that you know things are changing very, very fast. Some things are changing very, very fast. I think the customer journey really and the customer experiences just, there's nothing that goes beyond that. And that's really the next battleground for all brands. So thinking about the experience in not you know, omni-channel ways as two separate channels, but thinking of them as being omnipresent and keeping the consumer as the channel is what would be the key takeaway for me. Great. Yeah. Uh, great, so I think, uh, you know, it's a good way to sum up the whole discussion. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, you know, for all your thoughts. So I would like to open uh, the questions uh, from the audience. Any questions you have? 